Have we started? I believe we have started. I'm just sort of waiting for the Badger live streams to go live. Yes, we are starting. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. This is Fireside Chat number 89. I am here with, well, Philip Tanzer. Is that how you pronounce it? Tanzer? Tanzer. Um, yeah. He is uh, better known as Logan McCree. Um, what what do you do, Philip? What is your profession? Well, or profession? <laughs> I've got a lot of professions. I, I'm I'm a hairdresser. Uh, I'm a massage therapist. I'm an artist. So behind me, the, these are some of my art pieces. So I've got an art gallery. Um, I'm a firefighter for another one and a half weeks. Then I'm retiring from that. Uh, and I used to, well, pe most people know me because I used to do porn, gay porn, gay porn. And was, yeah. was, uh, was this only in like Europe or is this like a kind of, everywhere? no, that was, that was almost exclusively in America. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't live in America, but we shot the movies over there. I see. I see. So, uh, I, you know, out of curiosity with the porn thing, I didn't know this until like I saw the Vice article. I, I just don't, yeah. I don't think about this stuff, you know, very much. But when you were at the ICMI, did people uh, recognize you at all? Not that I know. I mean, okay. I talked with some people about it simply because it came up in conversations, but uh, they didn't know it. No. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, um, well, the, it's pretty interesting that somebody with so many different jobs, you're kind of like a renaissance man, I guess you could say, you know, you've done a little bit of this and that. Uh, and, and yet you took an interest in this discussion, this sort of uh, movement of men's issues. So what what got you involved with that? Why did you decide that this was something of interest to you? Well, I... I think I was always very interested in equality and um, when I was a when I was a kid in high school uh, a little a girl in my class she hit me in the face uh, because I was saying something too loud uh, next to her ear and her immediate reaction was to slap me in the face and I slept back and she looked at me horrified because I slept back and I was quite I, I would I was like, why? What's wrong? I mean, that to me is equality. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to be hit, then don't hit me. And uh, then over the years, um, I, when I was, I would say between, yeah, quite early on and then the age of 17, I identified as um, asexual uh, with an interest in man. And then I felt more and more pushed by society to use the label gay, which never felt completely comfortable for me. Um, why, why, uh, why not? I'm just out of curiosity. Uh, I don't, well, first of all, I mean, I was walking around like a mix between Prince and Marilyn Manson. And uh, I listened to metal music and stuff like that. And pretty much the only thing that I had... Um, well, I like guys, but to me, gay came with a identity. I would say, like with you like had a certain to, like you had to like the village people and um, and like Mamma well, Mia that, and stuff and show tunes. And <laughs> I'm kidding, but um, is, is that what do you that, see? Are you saying that being gay comes with uh, a certain um, expected? Let's say um, it comes with an expected like personality traits, interests, and that kind of thing. Is that what you mean? That that that's that's how it felt to me. And well, the thing is, and and I also um, to to me, I never really understood labels. Yeah. And I was like, well, I like some guys, but what does what does gay mean? I I, I just it didn't feel feel right, and I didn't have interest in having sex with men. So um, that's why I used asexual with a tendency towards men. And then I felt pressured into the label gay. And at the age of 32, I started, um, because I, I never saw myself being in a relationship with, uh, with a man. I was in short-term relationships, but to me, I was physically attracted to men and I can fall in love with men, but I never understood why I should live with a man. To me, men and women have very different energies. And to me, 
living so close with another man, it was just like a multiplication of the same energy where with a woman, it create for me personally, it creates something new. And I really like that a little bit of the yin and yang going on. Um, and at the age of 32, uh, most of my friends are, are straight. Um, and especially with one of them, he, uh, uh, we, we talked about sexuality a lot, but it, we predominantly talked about his sexuality. And at one point I was like, I should really try that woman thing again. I mean, I had sex with women when I was 18 and it was okay, sure. but, but it, I, I didn't feel that kind of like real connection. And then at 32, I tried it again. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, this is exactly what was missing in my life. And since then I, um, I, I knew that I could actually have a, a, re, a beautiful relationship with a woman, but I never, um, it was always clear that I like man as well. So I'm in a committed relationship with a woman, but uh, it's open so that I can sometimes have experiences with man as well. Mm. Well, so yeah, so your your uh, sexuality is um, it sounds like it's a bit atypical, a bit complex, and yet, uh, despite all of the sort of bad press and and representations that the men's rights movement often gets, uh, you are pretty welcome there. Is that correct? Oh, ab absolutely. And to be honest, I um, on on the first day of the. Uh, International Conference for Men's Issues, there was a trans person as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked to talk to the person um, because uh, it's because I think everybody is welcome in the movement. Uh, and I think everybody can be represented and represent themselves in the movement. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get, get a chance to talk to, to the person. Well, if you get to go to more of them, you'll find actually uh, the MRM. I was just talking about this yesterday. We did a show where we were going through um, Eric Anderson's work. He's the uh, professor that presented at the ICMI. That was a topic of a lot of discussion around masculinity and what it means yeah. and those kinds of things. And what we were I talking about it. Yeah, yeah, we were talk we we talked about it too at the ICMI. But one of the things that mm -hmm. I was pointing out that I found really interesting is, is that there is, I haven't really seen um, in in movements like this uh, such a disproportionate amount of gay, bi, and trans men or, or trans mm -hmm. women technically, but uh, gay, bi, and trans yeah. people involved with the MRM when I'm when I mean disproportionate I mean considering the uh you know number of the the percentage of the population that is trans the percentage of the population that is gay and bi there is a yeah. large number of those kinds of men in the movement and other men that maybe don't fit neatly into any of those categories but but just for the sake of simplicity you know as I said I don't really care about these labels anyways to me People are people, and I'm like uh, in when you read the correction that I wrote on the Vice interview, uh, I all re also wrote that I actually the reason why I support man's rights is because I think that um, that the man's rights movement is uh, underrepresented, underfunded. Um, and all the other movements, I think they're doing really, really well. I'm not taking away any, um, I think that women still have to fight for a lot of issues. I don't think that feminists necessarily uh, fight for the real issues that women face. I think they're too focused on political things that are actually not as much of a problem anymore. Uh -huh. Uh, but I do think that women, obviously, in our society still face a lot of issues. And every woman that is a victim of domestic violence is a victim of domestic violence. Um, but I think it's at this time, uh, it's much, much easier for a woman to find help and to talk about it than for men. And that's why I really support the men's uh, men's rights movement. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's basically the MRM doesn't. Uh, does not necessarily want to not discuss women's issues. We, exactly. we are of the opinion that 
many of the issues that are considered w women's issues are actually just human issues. But you just leave the men out of the uh, equation and then you basically make it a woman's issue. And because, you know, sort of we're sort of biologically wired to care about women uh, mm -hmm. so much that it actually we're more likely to respond with, you know, uh, donations and charity and um, yeah, and, and just, just like stand up and, and say yeah. something. But just unfortunately, yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> my customer who is just sitting here. She, um, she was agreeing with everything and nodding along. And when you said that um, we are wired, hardwired hard hard to care about women, um, there is, as a man, um, if you want to, you can come in. My hair is still wet. I apologize. Her, her, her hair is still wet because Sorry. I was just like dyeing her hair yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> So um, a little explanation about the hard wiring to, to help women mm -hmm. um, from a man's point of view. And I would say from society's point of view, it's um, innate to protect women. Back in the days, you had to because when there was no uh, contraception, women were pregnant mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. and you had to protect them, make mm -hmm. sure that they were warm and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that our society is still predominantly targeted towards helping children and women. If, if there is something happening as a man, I would first run to the child, second to the woman, and then to the man. Um, and I think that is something you do find in society and I, as a per I'm completely fine with that. I, but because I, I think there are certain things in in, in life that, um, that that to me are okay. For example, I don't expect women to do exactly the same labors as men because men statistically have a different body structure. Um, that does. That does not mean that women can't do it or shouldn't do it, but predominantly it will be the man. And I'm, I'm down with that as long as it's been just recognized as well. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong with it. I think that, for example, women are really good as caretakers of the children, especially in the first two, three years. Mm -hmm. it, there is a certain bounding. Not saying that man, man can't do it. And I, when I when I become a father, I want to be just as much there as, as the mother. Um, so when we talk about this hard wiring, um, I think there is an, um, almost like a need to protect certain people over other people. Why? Why protect some people it, over other people? Well, it's 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 not it's it's because we um, well, it's like he explained. It's sort of like we evolved this way. That doesn't mean that we. That this is not biological determinism per se, but it's basically getting an under uh, an idea of how, why things do work out the way they do. We have a better understanding. It, it, one good example is. Look at the breast cancer funding versus prostate cancer funding. Prostate cancer and breast cancer affect men and women at about equal rates. They're both just as severe and just as serious. And we do, um, we do drives for both of them. You know, we reserve November for prostate cancer or men's health. And I don't remember what month of the year. I think we, we, um, we do uh, breast cancer. I want to say it's like um, maybe October or, or September or something. But breast okay. cancer raises like it way more money like we we're yeah. way more concerned with it we spend way more money on it there's a lot more sort of uh, media attention that goes towards it you know football players are happy to put on like a uh, a ribbon on their uniforms and and so on so it it doesn't mean that uh this is something that we are necessarily consciously choosing to do but subconsciously we have yeah we there's, have. A, there's a natural tendency to to look at certain issues or at certain people more. As, as I said, I, I think everybody, if there was an incident, everybody would um, help the children first. Yeah, it's... and you make an assess assessment, and I think it would be children, then maybe very old people, women, and then 
at the end, man. I think that's um, that's there, there would be there would be some. That's some... almost assuming that it's just the men who are the ones doing the helping. The women would be right in there helping the children. They and would. The elderly people. They would, but oh. women also tend to prioritize women over men, and they they um, because again, there it's 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 not because we hate men. It's because we we are okay with men being more disposable than women, and men are also okay with that um, in general. I I mean I, I see myself as like I I mean I'm a firefighter for another one and a half weeks, sure. um, and to me it's completely normal to uh, to sacrifice myself. Like, like yeah. I mean, I, I was in the army for three years. Okay, I'm, I'm still a pacifist, but like for me, uh, uh, engaging the thought of, of dying for somebody else is relatively normal. I don't know how how how, and, and that is quite on the forefront of my of, of my thoughts. It's, it's not something something atypical to think for for me. Yeah. So anyway, the article. The article. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll look at the article. But but just to so you understand, what we're talking about is um, the thing that's interesting about m issues. A lot of the issues that that we consider to be in sort of like the mainstream discourse that we consider to be women's issues are also men's issues. But the funny thing about it is because of that program that we're talking about. If we include men in the conversation of, say, domestic violence, for example, where men are only slightly less likely to be victims, but nonetheless are, then um, it actually makes people even less sympathetic for the issue overall because they, yeah. they, they, they're, they actually are less likely to, to care as much, even though it's affecting more people, like twice as many or something, right? And that's just something that we should be able to, we should talk about so that we can try to get people to be more sort of conscious of uh, and, and, and more uh, sort of willing to see men as potential victims, potential sufferers, potential, you know, people who need help. And and this includes men. This is, this is not a, I'm not blaming women for anything. Go on. As you said early, earlier, more looking at things as human problems. Uh, yes. And not just one side or the other side, yes. but if the other yes. side is, as in this case, the, the man's problems are completely like taking out of the equation, uh, you have to emphasize this. Like for I, I would say I care about people, um, but if you ignore one half of the people, then there is a good reason to highlight that. That that's yeah. what to me. Uh, that's why I think there are reasons to be a, be a man's rights activist. That does not mean that you don't care about the rights of women. No, of course. No, like no. I, 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 think, both, but I think that the man's issues have to be highlighted simply because they nobody looks at them at the moment. Right, and there, and this is not a zero sum game, that, which is very important. So exactly. it's not. It's not like well, you it's, know. It's, well, there is a problem with funding, obviously. I, um, I had a conversation with a neighbor the other week, and I mentioned domestic violence, and I said that there are no shelters for men, or I think there's one shelter in the UK for men of domestic violence. And then she, she said, yeah, but did you know that women's shelters are being, some women's shelters are being shut now? And I was like, yeah, that's horrible, and they shouldn't be closed down. But at least there are some. There are none for men. And she was like, yeah, but but they're closing some for women now. And, and I was like, yeah, that's bad. But at least you have some. But in that case, there is a there is a problem because there is a limited amount of funding. And if you if you divide the money, then you would say, oh, maybe maybe the shelters have to be open for both genders or half of the or let's say a third of the shelters have to be for men. And then you have to take something away from the women. So I do think that uh, that women as a whole and yeah. predominantly political feminists, they do have a reason to be afraid of certain things. Um, but 
I know that like men's rights activists, I mean, at least the ones that I know, they don't want to take anything away, like support away from female victims. No. But in the end, if we are real, realistic, where does the money come from? In, in the end, there needs to be much more funding for both sides. No, I, I hear that. I think that what I'm getting at is um, maybe I miss I, I'm using the wrong terminology when I say zero sum game. What I mean is what we're asking for does not mean we're t we want to take anything away from women per se, although because there are, you know, we live in a world of finite resources in a way it does sound like we are. But what we're asking for is that people consider the male half of the equation. And then we, it may mean that we have to reevaluate everything, but maybe some of these, and I would, I would argue this is the, the truth. Some of the large, like multi-billion dollar industries that feminists often work with to to help women a lot of that money doesn't actually make it to where they you know where it's supposed to go right because the the thing and, and i don't want to get too hung up on this point too much but the thing about feminism that i have to clarify feminism is not the same as women's rights advocacy it's not WRAs, right? MRAs and WRAs are separate. Feminism is an industry that is has a focus on making money and making feminists that also mm -hmm. can go back into the system. So yes, and and but I would I, I, I would I would say like um, there are still there are definitely feminists out there that I would to a large extent agree with uh, feminists that are about actually like emotional empowerment of women and proper equality. Um, feminists that say, hey girls, stop whining. And actually like sure. when, when, when a guy like does something that you don't like, say stop, say no, punch him in the face instead of um, like saying, oh, I'm a poor victim and then uh, complaining afterwards. Obviously, there are situations where where you can't help yourself. I, I'm, I'm not taking like... No, I, I know, I know. You're saying, but you're, you're basically saying there are people out there that call themselves feminists that don't engage in the victim politics. They actually want to help exactly. women like basically become their own persons. And, I'm, and I, I think that's totally fine. I guess when I speak about feminism i'm talking about the ideology and the business not necessarily individual men and women that call themselves feminists because when you get in that's when you get into like the, the the fuzzy sort of you know what does the label mean for you and you know and all that so but anyways yeah but, but it's important to say that uh when you are against something that you are against the predominant ideology how it's portrayed in in our culture right yeah, now. yeah well basically um, how, it's, we... how the actual business is actually you know expressing itself the, the there's the feminists at the top that sort of run things and then there are the 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 sort of everyday people that use the label because they still you know they believe in like what it means um you know at heart like at, at what they believe it means at its core and i think those are decent people just saying well, I just believe in equality. And it's like, well, yeah, there's no way to argue against that. Um, but but yeah. that's one of the things that I've been doing uh, on the channel when I talk to people about this is I, I, I ask them, I, I ask them to think about, you know, is this label more important than the actions? Because if the actions you're doing, I can agree with, then maybe you don't need the label necessarily. And I think that's a difficult thing to do. That's what Cassie J was going through while she was making her film, right? And so- yeah. Um, that's why she dropped it because she said this is not but, but apply to me, right? But but see, so for example, there are certain people in the men's rights movement that where I don't agree with their rhetoric. Sure. Uh, for the most part, I agree with what they say, but I don't agree with how they say it. So, for example, uh, obviously the most uh, famous example is Paul Elam, and I think when I read his articles, I'm like. Wow, at the core, they're absolutely right for the most part. Um, but the way he says it sounds so inflammatory and so negative that I that I can understand when people get very triggered yeah. uh, because of it. And I would say if too many people in the men's rights movement would use language like him, then I wouldn't want to associate with the with the movement. But he is one of very, very many. And then most people that I talk to don't use that that um, that language and are very, very 
friendly towards um, everybody, uh, sometimes even trying to be friendly to people that outrightly attack them. Yeah. Fair enough. I, 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 how long have you been involved with this, by the way? Uh, just, just over a year, uh, which was misrepresented in the article as pretty mm. much everything that was in the article. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, um, so you have been I, doing I, we the... Will get in... Yeah, we're going to get into the article so, yeah. now. I just wanted... So you haven't been doing this for very long. No, no. This was my first conference that I attended. And um, the... I, I started, I, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more uh, longer than that, I started listening to some of the uh, videos that Karen Strong uh, did. And I was like, oh, wow, she, she's really smart. And her information were kind of mind blowing. And uh, shortly after that, I uh, watched The Red Pill mm -hmm. and yeah, rab rabbit hole effect. Uh, so, and... And I would say that I'm very, well, I guess most people would say that about themselves, but I would say that I'm very balanced. So I, re I really try to look at both sides all the time. And I, I don't call myself an anti-feminist. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I, I, for example, the non-feminist declaration that uh, Mike Buchanan wrote when he read read it out at the conference, I felt quite uneasy about it. When I read it at home, I was like, oh, actually, apart from one or two things, I actually agree with what he says. Sure. But, but again, it's the words that sometimes that I ha have problems with. And I, I really try with everything I hear in the men's rights movement from feminists, I always try to look at how it feels and I'm like, does that feel right or does it feel wrong? And then I try to check fact, uh, fact check uh, a little bit to come to my own conclusion. Oh. Um, and when I had the interview, the vice interview with uh, Robert Jackman, he called me after he already he had already released the relatively the pretty negative interview about the um, conference. And so I knew a little bit what to expect, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt and he, and I told him, look, I understand that your article was more negative than positive because you have a certain worldview. And according yeah. to that world, worldview, you focused more on things at the conference that triggered you. I give that example. Um, to people here before, if you have a problem with gay rights or gay people and you go to a gay pride, what will stand out most to you? It will be drag queens and leather guys in harnesses with their butts hanging out. That's what, just a second. No problem. Oh my God, the place is going to blow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, oh my God. I, he makes bombs on the side, guys. I didn't know. Um, oh, and typical, typical I MRA stuff. I, yeah, I should have asked you about your religious affiliation. Is <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. Well, that, that right there is Jesus in a frying pan. So, oh, so. okay, okay. Um, hey, and, and I'm, I'm I, I really like I've got Muslim friends. So, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> That's exactly what an yeah. Islamophobe would say. I <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, we're going to go ahead and look at the so, article, but, but you haven't been yes. doing this for very long and you know, everybody's got the, the, the pace at which they sort of figure this stuff out and they're on their path. So we're fine. I've said the same thing about Eric Anderson yesterday. I said, you know what? He came over here, much love, much respect for doing that. I hope that, you know, he, he really like digs in and looks very closely at the arguments and challenges us because I think that, you know, we want to be open to that. This is something that Paul oh. Elam, uh, he, he shared Eric Anderson's original, um, you know, post. And he said, I don't agree with this man, but I, I am really happy to see that someone with these views was able to come here and talk and we weren't hostile to the him and we didn't turn it into a, a, an echo chamber. And I think that is the most important thing because at the end of the day, I'm after the truth. 
And so I'm willing Absolutely. to, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to endure whatever to get there. So speaking of, I, I, I have to say, I, have to say I disliked, uh, and during uh, Anderson's lecture, there was, there were quite a few things that I agreed with, especially reaching out to, let's say, the enemy. So communicating to uh, the feminist side that is open to conversation and actually try to find uh, solutions together or, or challenge each other. I'm, yeah. I'm, I was completely on board with that. But then I thought that overall he played m way too much identity politics and I think he couldn't uh, look beyond the fact that he's he's gay and th I think he had mm -hmm. a very very strong LGBT agenda uh, on his view of masculinity which I felt uncomfortable with and I think it's completely fair to say that as somebody who uh, dated men for right. uh, 15 years yeah yeah for sure I mean um... oh, and, and, and still going on obviously <laughs> right <laughs> Okay, so um, I don't want to get hung up on Eric Anderson because this is actually about you. So we're going to look at this. I'm going to put up the screen. This is a Vice article. Uh, I guess we can call it an opinion piece um, written by Robert Jackman. He wrote uh, the original Vice article about the ICMI. He interviewed you at the ICMI, yeah. right? So, no, 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 he didn't. He didn't. No, absolutely. He, he contacted me um, through Twitter and said, oh, um, I thought you were quite an interesting character and I would like to interview you. It's going to be a fair interview. Um, and we and he really, really made sure that I felt comfortable. I and I was like, huh, this guy, he does have his opinion and he's completely entitled to his opinion. But he seems to be willing to to give me a fair chance and to express myself and and hopefully uh, express that excuse me in the article. And he was we had a great conversation. We were talking for an hour, and I recorded the whole interview mm -hmm. without without telling him. So I don't have his questions, but I do have everything that I said uh, on record. And he misquoted me in absolutely everything except of certain facts about my uh, gay past and one or two things that I talked about porn. Uh, but no. everything else. Are you saying that Vice <laughs> misrepresented you in in an article? That's crazy Shocker. talk. No, but imagine my shock. <laughs> Oh, I got a couple of super chats. So yeah, we're gonna go through it, and uh, I'll read it, and then we'll, you know, you tell me if there's a correction, uh, or I'll ask you questions related to what I read instead. How about that? So first, I have a couple super chats. Um, if you guys have any super chat questions for Mr. Tanzer, Tanzer or Tanzer uh, or anything really, just put them through, and I'll read them out loud. Okay? Zeranx gives us two dollars. And says, interestingly, June is Men's Health Month. I think that means June is Men's Health Month. I thought it was November. Um, Mr. Roboto gives us two dollars and says, "Women's rights activists, do they still exist?" Yes, we are women's rights activists as well. Because the thing is, we we don't we look at both sides of the equation when we talk about men's issues. We have a focus on men's issues because we largely ignore them in our main, you know, sort of like our mainstream public discourse. But we do care about women's issues as well as they are interlinked. You know, what what you do for men will have an effect on women and vice versa. But you cannot leave one of them out. And also, women have a masculine side, which has to also be sort of. Um, uh, cherished and treasured in its own way. So th this is, I, I think that we are WRS. Yes. Trade. <laughs> so yeah, just, they just. still exist. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and look at the article. A conversation with Philip Tanzer, AKA Logan McCree. There's a photo. How does an award-winning porn star become a self-identified men's rights activist? That's the question I found myself asking after I gate crashed the world's biggest men's rights summit, the International Conference on Men's Issues in London last month. At the conference, I, f I met Philip Tanzer, also known as Logan McCree, a German-born performer famed for all of his all-over tattoos and award-winning threesomes. 
Having been crowned Germany's Mr. Leather in 2004, Tanzer went on to star in dozens of films, signing an exclusive deal with one of America's biggest produ producers of gay porn, Raging Stallion Studios. I, of course they would call it that. In 2012, Tanzer left porn behind when he moved to Durness. Is that how you say it? Uh, Durness, yeah. Durness, okay. One of the northernmost towns of the remote Scottish Highlands. Since then, he's divided his time between running an art gallery and becoming more involved in the murky world of men's rights activism. Can I stop you right there? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, because I wrote, like, in between the things that he wrote, I already wrote corrections where he was wrong, and I've got them right in front of me. Do you want me to just read them out? Uh, re read out what? The things he got wrong? Yeah, because I already read you. I already oh. wrote all the corrections. Yeah, yeah. I just need. Okay, you know what we can do is because I I want the audience to see the questions, and then get like mm -hmm. what what this guy's take was. I guess you know what what he is trying the way that he's trying to twist it. So I need to, we need to see both sides. But I do have a question from the chat. Michael Keller, he didn't have enough money for a super chat, but I'll read it out for you anyway. He says, I can't afford a super chat. Does Philip believe that there's a part of the feminist movement that's willing to talk to MRAs? If yes, where or why? Yes, I do believe that there, well, I do believe that there are feminists out there, self self-identifying feminists out there that are willing to talk about men's issues because I do believe that there are women and men outside that see feminism as uh, fighting for uh, fighting for the women's act. issues uh, women's issues as human issues and they would listen to men's issues as well um, I think there are a lot of women out there that are not aware how toxic and negative um, organized feminism and political feminism is. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I hope that that is a satisfactory answer to your question, Mr. Keller. Uh, all right. So let's see what, what um, I want to get to some of the stuff that's a little bit sketchy. <laughs> it's like the whole article. Uh, Let's see. When we spoke on the phone after the conference, Tanzer uh, insisted he had always supported gender equality. The problem for him, he said, was that most modern feminists now shunned egalitarianism in favor of special privileges for women while simultaneously lab labeling themselves as victims. But it was his interest in child custody that led Tanzer to make the jump to becoming a full-on MRA. Does that, mm -hmm. Is that a fair representation? Uh, well... Uh, actually, it wasn't a problem with feminism that, and I'm going to write, read out what I wrote. So uh, it was not problems with feminism that made me an MRA, and I'm not too concerned with certain privileges that women may or may not have. Um, and I have no problem with women or anybody else for that matter that are or were victims of something to self-identify as victims, even though I find it problematic and counterproductive when people hold on to their victimhood. But I am not in favor of a victim culture that defines a gender or race as victims. This attitude diminishes people because of their race and gender. What brought me to the MRM was the observation that there are a lot of problems that men face that are not being addressed and that men and masculinity are being portrayed as something negative in our society. The author's rhetoric of calling me full on MRA, MRA and feeling at home in the MRA world implies that I lack critical distance to the movement. I am and have always been a critical thinker and I question and disagree with some of the most prominent figures, uh, figureheads of the movement, but not, and this is important, because of what they fight for, but how they choose to fight. I agree, for example, with a lot of what Paul Elam, uh, one of the most important voices in the MRM, uh, says, but don't like his rhetoric at all and find it counterproductive. So that's what I wrote in the counter. Oh yeah, I have the thing right here. I guess I could just, uh, cause I have your thing open. So maybe we'll, we'll go through that. 
Um, so there's another clip here, or this is a, a earlier paragraph. I thought this was a good one too. He's uh, where um, Jackman says, "Looking back, it's hard to say what I found so unlikely about Tanzer's conversation. After all, the world of man on man conversion. porn conversion, hmm? conversion not conversion. Oh, conversion. conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, looking back, it's hard to say what I found so unlikely about Tanzer's conversion." I don't like that he uses the word conversion because it makes it sound like a religion. Um, I don't know if you said that already, but I'm just throwing that in there. After uh, all, I, I mentioned that. Oh, okay. Uh, after all, the world of man on man porn is hardly known for its enlightened approach to gender relations, but I wanted to know how he had come to feel so at home in the MRA world. Yeah. My comment to that was um, the world conversion implies that there was a time when I had different views on man's rights. That is not the case. I was always in favor of equality of both genders, including shared responsibilities. I supported and support the rights of women, LGBTQ, and men where I see injustice. Supporting one group does not mean ignoring the struggles of the other groups. To me, the MRM need my support, what I said earlier. Um, the most at the moment because it is unlike supporters of women's and lgbtq issues drastically understaffed and as we can see in this article not respected and often silenced about the enlightened approach to gender uh, relations in the man-on-man -man porn industry people working in this industry are like in all parts of life and society diverse and the notion that they probably don't have complex views is prejudice. I met very intelligent and complex and also very simple and unreflective people in the industry, like everywhere else in life. When you say the industry, do you mean the porn industry? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's one the same everywhere. I mean, they're... Yeah, they're... sure, sure. I, I just wasn't sure what you were specifically referring to. Absolutely. There's different kinds of people with different opinions everywhere. Yeah. But it, it, I think that this is the thing, though, with the, the Vice article. What he's, what he's suggesting in this paragraph is that the, uh, the, the LGBTQ issues facing men are not issues that men's rights activists care about, which is really strange because, as we said in the beginning of the, this, this interview, there is a largely disproportionate number of lgbtq plus men in the movement like well i mean not l but the other <laughs> the other ones um so uh, we have a uh, male sexuality is a large focus on what we talk about in the movement which includes all kinds it's not this is not an ex a, sp a space that excludes men that are not heterosexual and cisgendered, which I think is what this guy is implying. But that has been the narrative around the MRM because they think that well, for whatever reason, we don't we don't well, um, want to make that I a thing. What, I think what he wants to uh, imply as well is that as the industry of men on man porn obviously doesn't have to deal with with women so and because obviously he thinks that mrm uh fo mainly focuses on the problems of men with women which is complete nonsense obviously he thinks that um there is no connection between people i would think that he thinks there is no place for same-sex loving people in the mrm yeah. movement because it doesn't concern them i would say though that there are certain issues that uh, gay, trans, and so on, men face that can be better addressed in the LGBTQ movement because they're more specialized. But I don't think that um, they're not being addressed or that in the MRM movement, and I don't think that MRM would ever say, oh, because you're gay or because you're queer or transgender, this is not the place for your problems. Um, and to be honest, I think even if there were lesbians that had problems or obviously even when there are women that have problems, there is a place in the MRM for everybody and everybody's struggles and problems. As, yeah. long, as, as long as they are respectful to um, legit and respectful. Yeah, I would. I mean, I, I guess for uh, tactically speaking. Um, issues facing, uh, you know, gay, trans, bi, and other, you know, types of men 
that are sort of like gender and uh, sexuality atypical might be better addressed by the the movement uh, mainly because they have more um, they have more headway they have more resources they're they're more politically um, you know powerful so they can get more done in that way but uh, I think that the MRM is 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 not disinterested in issues facing gay men. We are not we are not exclusively for straight men at all. And we but and I think that the conversation can continue. We can probably do it from a way without turning. And this is the thing that I really like about the the at least the people I work with in the MRM. We're not turning the issues of um, LGBTQ people into political playing pieces in the same way that we don't do it for men themselves. We just want to talk about the issues. We don't want to make, yeah. you know, victim groups and, uh, and, and progressive stacks and that kind of thing, because that's the, one of the, I guess, one of the things that I find that can be irritating about, uh, civil rights groups like LGBTQ groups, because they can sometimes politicize things too much, make the, the homosexuality too much of a political tool. And that, that, what that ends up doing is it, it focuses on them as a group instead of the individuals within it. And because the Absolutely. individuals within it, they have their own needs. They have their own issues, you know, that are personal. So it's, it's more difficult to talk about this stuff on a, on a case by case basis when you're always well, trying to turn a group of people into uh, playing pieces, you know, for your political backgammon. Well, and because they do it, uh, they talk about the group as well, because they use group identity, they can't accept if somebody is different from the group identity. So they can't accept yes. when there is a conservative uh, homosexual or lesbian, or if, yeah, that is a problem because they actually don't care about your problems anymore if you don't fully support their agenda. So, for example, I'm absolutely pro gay marriage and partnership, but I do have some problems with gay adoption. I'm not against gay adoption, but I do say, well, there might be issue, issues for the children that have to be looked at first. And for me, that's more important than um, the fulfillment of adults that, yeah, the fulfillment of adults. So, I, mm -hmm. so I'm not against it. But because I'm not completely on board with gay adoption, I'm already a traitor. Yeah, and that's the funny thing is, too, is that once this is true of, of lots of other, uh, you know, sort of civil rights groups, the politicized ones, they actually can kick you out of their group. <laughs> so you can be yeah. like no longer considered part of the LGBTQ community if they decide, which is strange because this is, uh, you know, uh, something that is an inherent part of what you are. But it yeah. also, and so, you know, it's like, am I officially no longer bi or gay or whatever? That doesn't yeah. make a lot of sense, but that's what happens when you politicize something and you make it into a tribe is that you suddenly have this, this uh, desire to kick people out. I mean, look at, um, you know, look at black people that don't toe the, um, say, the leftist Democrat line. They are considered uh, Uncle Toms and, and race traders, and they get they are kicked out culturally out of the black community, and they're no longer considered black by people from within it. And this is the thing that I want yeah. to avoid. I don't want to get into that, and I think that we've been pretty good about it so far. Um, yeah. I, I, I think there are, like in every movement, I do think that amongst the MRAs, there are a, a couple of nut cases that are very extreme. Uh, but, and I think there were like, I, I met three at the conference where I'm like, ah, oh, you sound a little extreme. Um, and one of them actually said something or had a question to one of the speakers. And the reaction from the audience was very interesting because the, the audience was almost kind of like, look, dude, you don't get it. Uh -huh. um, and and I, I think that the men's rights movement, to a, to a large extent, self-corrects and says, well, look, this is, this is too extreme. And I think that um, you might have that a little less amongst MGTOWs. As far as I know, there's a little bit more, <clears throat> they're a bit rougher around the edges. Uh -huh. But I think amongst the uh, men's rights movement, it's very inclusive and loving. Yeah, a, 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 a quick word about MGTOW. Um, 
I would say that I don't know that I would even call it a movement. I know some people do. I, I think that the vast majority of MGTOW, the vast majority of MGTOW, you don't even hear from because they're actually doing the going your own way thing. So they're not yeah. talking about it. They're not making videos. They're not making content. They're not writing writing articles. They're just going their own way and that's it. They're just so the, Yeah, they're just going their own way. And that's why I don't think it's really a movement per se. It's more like a philosophy. And um, yeah. the, the, but, but that being said, the, of the ones that are talking about it, there are probably a good number of them that are going through the sort of red pill rage stage, you know, where yeah. um, going MGTOW is more of an emotional response, you know, and, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not, this is not plastering MGTOW. I, I think that what they're doing makes a lot of sense, but I think the ones that we're, we're hearing from are probably not a good representation of them as a whole. And uh, to, me, to me, MGTOW is a reaction. And, it is. But, it's a, but to me, uh, MGTOW is, a, is an understandable reaction, but it will not lead to, um, to a healthier society. I think people... Uh, I prefer people that try to actively make the world a better place rather than to check out of the world and say, you know what, I give up, I retreat. Uh, I, I respect it, uh, mm -hmm. but I think there is a better way. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I feel that. I mean, but again, I don't think these men are looking to change anything. I think they just want to protect themselves. So, But anyway, I don't want to get too caught up in that because that's not what we're uh, supposed to talk about um so let me go back to the article so we were t you you talked a little bit about or this guy talks a little bit about um child custody and this, yeah. this is the bit that i, I want to read out he says in some ways it's no surprise men's rights activists have been raging about child custody since time immemorial long before fathers for justice even thought of scaling the houses of parliament in their sweaty superhero costumes What's interesting about Tanzer, though, is that he didn't have children or even a female partner to take them away. Quote, for a long time, I was predominantly interested in men, he told me. I didn't identify as gay and I did, as I didn't really fit in with gay culture. For a while, I even called myself asexual, but with a preference for men. I always had wanted a family and it was important for me that it would be with a female partner so that my children would be a product of a loving relationship. When I got to my 30s, I started dating women again and looking to start a family. All right. Any yeah. response? So, yeah. My response was uh, he unintentionally made it sound as if I think that a same-sex relationship can't be loving, which, of course, is nonsense. My exact words were, and that's, as I said, I recorded it all, so I listened to to these parts and wrote it out. Mm -hmm. um, I always wanted a family, but I never wanted to have a family without having a partner, a female partner that I could have children with. And I really wanted the children to be a product of love and a relationship and not just because I feel lonely, because I don't feel lonely, but I think that having children is, a wonder, uh, is something wonderful. So. To me, there was no connection between loving and having a relationship with a woman. Of course, you have, can have a loving relationship with uh, a man as well. To me, it was important that when I have children, that I actually love the woman and that, I be, that I'm in a relationship with a woman. I just mm -hmm. wanted to highlight that that was the reason why I, for example, if... If I was completely gay um, and I was in a relationship with a man, I think I still wouldn't want to adopt children because I would want to have children um, and actually spending time with the mother and loving the mother so that we're all together. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I, I get what you're getting at. I think um, another thing that I will take that I got from this guy's this particular section of the article was 
Uh, and I heard him say this in his previous article, too. He says men's rights activists have been raging about child custody since time immemorial before Fathers for Justice even thought of scaling the Houses of Parliament in their sweaty superhero costumes. There's a bit of a dismissal there. And there's also oh, like this strange okay. thing where, you know, it sounds like he's basically and I could be wrong because I'm going to have Robert Jackman on the show. So I'll get it like from the horse's mouth, you know, because I, I don't want to be inaccurate here. But um, I get the he's, sense he's really good. he comes across as super charming and super nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I get I get the sense that there is a bit of a dismissal going on, like um, like the men are making a big deal out of something trivial, like fathers' rights and custody of their children, which is really strange because I think that the, most men who have children, well, actually, no, I want to go even further than that. Most men want to be fathers. At least, like, mm -hmm. without – if you take away all of the red tape and all of the dangers, if a man could just have kids and be with his kids and support his kids, he would most of the time. And that that is yeah. not a – I don't think that's a radical thing to say. I think that all of the problems with, like, father's rights and custody and everything make it very difficult – for men to want it because there's too many things that are making them afraid. And uh, on the other side, you know, there's a lot of incentive for women to not necessarily need to have a father in their life if they just want to have kids because the government will take care of them or whatever. But if I were to just look at I it agree. out. I think, I think there is another, uh, I think there is another dimension that uh, Jordan Peterson addresses quite, quite well is that men don't grow up as well yeah don't men men don't grow up and i think it's part of growing up to at one point wanting children so i think the wish to have children comes maybe quite a bit later and maybe they never grow out of the stage of uh, confusion and finding themselves and structures in their life which is uh so which is not completely just custody problems and divorce divorce but a whole culture that doesn't promote structure and family and uh stability yeah for sure um and it, that that that's uh that's true but i i think uh, ideally that's the thing father's rights are not trivial they're not mm -hmm. a joke you know, this is a yeah. serious issue, and that, and and he's he he. It seems to me that he's trivializing it a bit. Like if 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 this was women that were looking to get custody of their kids, I don't think he would treat it this way. I would I would have oh. to I would have to ask him. But it sounds like it's a little bit trivial, and I think that. Well, I, also, I told him because he he didn't understand. He actually said in the interview with me. He said, at the end of the interview, I was like, so did you? Did, did you get what you wanted? Did you understand everything I said? And he was like, um, well, the one thing is no MRA was ever able to tell me, to explain to me why they became an MRA. And I was like, what? Did, did, didn't you listen to me, what yeah, I really. said earlier? And then he was like, well, the, the custody lo um, laws and stuff like that. I, yeah, but it, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. And I said, well, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, and I, so I asked him, I was like, sorry to ask you, but are you gay or are you straight? And he was like, I'm straight. And I was like, okay, and you don't think that there is a problem? And he was like, well, I know I never, like, it never really occurred to me. And then I told him, look, if 50% of marriages end in divorce and in, I think it's 80% of cases women are the only care um, like custody holders is that yeah, correct most of the time yeah it's like it's like at least 80% that women yeah. uh, become the the single custody they get full custody of their kids yeah. so i said so when you get married and have children from the get go you have a 40% chance of losing your children if anybody would tell tell a woman, if you have children, in 40% of the cases, the government will take the children away from you, there would be a huge outcry, and rightfully so. I mean, nobody would deal with that. And I was like, and and that that is a reality. It's not like it's it's like 
5% of the cases when you have children that you lose them. No, it's much, much higher. It's a real problem. And he apparently still didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, that well, it's a it's a complicated issue. You have to like spend a lot of time with it. I think, I think there's some other stuff that might be going on, but that would get speculative. So let let's move on. Uh, perhaps predictably, the news of Tanzer's new relationship went down badly with his fans. This is the relationship with the woman, right? He yeah. issued he issued a statement refuting accusations that his screen career had been a cynical case of quote gay for pay. In fact, he had just exited a long-term relationship with another male performer and continued to sleep with men when dating women with the consent of his then-girlfriend. So um, go ahead and read your response, and then I'll, I'll add some additional comments. That, that, was, that was actually correct, um, with the exception that not all of my, f uh, my fans were unhappy. So, some fans said, oh... Good luck, um, and it's it's great that you are happy. And they didn't care that it was a relationship with a man or a woman. They simply just cared that I was happy, which I I was very happy about that. There were some open-minded ones, or yeah, a so, lot of open-minded ones. So there, yeah, there's a there's a little bit of slippery language in here because he says I uh, went down badly with his fans, but he didn't say with some fans, and that's yeah, a, that's an important. It's, that's, it's a little thing. Okay. But when you yeah. put it that way, it does. It makes it sound like you know it's more uh, general, and maybe there's sort of a creation, uh, an attempt to create a situation where you know this is why you should need um, LGBTQ uh, ag activists and not MRAs. I, I'm not sure because what is this? The cynical case of gay for pay is now gay for pay. Do you know what that you know what that saying means? Yeah. So gay for pay means that if a straight man does gay porn because it pays better. In the straight porn industry, men usually either yeah get next to no money, the women get uh, predominantly paid. Um, and in the gay porn industry, obviously the men get paid quite a bit. So um, there have always been especially in Eastern Europe, but also in America, a lot of straight men doing gay porn, even though they weren't into men. Right. But I all also worked with uh, some gay for pay actors that were officially straight, had sex with you in front of the camera. As soon as the camera stopped, they would stop having sex with you. But as soon as everybody else was out of the room, they would start having sex with you again. So they were, <laughs> they were uh, bisexual, secretly bisexual, uh, gay for pay. But yeah, I, I would just say, hey, drop the boxes, drop the labels, um, have sex with whoever you want to have sex with. Doesn't matter if you get paid for it or not. Who cares? And like out of curiosity, because I don't really see why this is a big deal. Why? Why does it matter if you're uh, gay for pay? Like, uh, there's plenty of oh, because, uh, female porn stars that are lesbian, and you know they have sex with straight men, and men generally that are into because, them because, don't care. Because you take money. Out. Well, there's a real reason, and there's a like a stupid reason. Because you take money from the LGBTQ community, even though you're straight. So you're using the LGBTQ community for your benefit, even though you're not part of it. So that is one side of the, the thing. The uh -huh. other part, the other part, and I do understand this part is you can, you can tell, like I've been working in, I oh. only, shot, only shot a couple of scenes sure. in Hungary sure. with straight actors. Never, never really in America. I, I, did some scenes in America with actors that were predominantly straight, but they were a pleasure to work with. But in Hungary, uh, it you really, as a gay actor, you felt like a piece of meat, and they were like, "Okay, let's let's do this." It was just work, and there was no connection. And I would say that you can tell in a video that there is no connection, and so the you could say that there is. Um, if the performance isn't good, then why should you pay for watching it? Right. There's that. Aspect. Yeah, that's but fair enough. Hand, I didn't. I didn't think about that. 
Yeah. But on the other hand, if you if you are straight, but you have no problem with giving a good performance and you respect your scene partners, that I, then I see no problem with doing gay porn, even though even though you're straight. Um, it leads to these issues. For example, I don't know if you heard about the case, but Scarlett Johansson, she was supposed to play uh, a trans woman, mm -hmm, and and now she was kind of like forced out of the project. And I think the pro the whole project started with her attached, and now she had to back off because the as far as I know, the trans community said uh, that only a trans person should play this role, which obviously is ridiculous because yeah. the actors, if if Tilda Swinton plays a male person because she is an incredibly good actress, then that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's what acting is all about. If, if you can only use can you only use mass murderers to play mass murderers? I mean, where's this leading to? It's stupid. Yeah, um, I think it I think it's obviously tricky for a trans actor to get to get roles. I get that, but in the end, what's better, actually getting a movie made that respects your community and that sheds a light to a mainstream audience? And with the attachment of uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson, obviously you get a bigger audience than with an unknown trans actress. So you you have to choose your your battles wisely. And I, as far as it's quite possible that they ain't gonna make the movie. So you, you lost the whole fight just yep. because of a little battle. Uh, Eddie Redmayne, when he played um, the Danish girl, I mean, he was transcendent, he was, uh, his performance, he should have gotten the Oscar for it. It's okay that he didn't because Leonardo DiCaprio was, a, uh, it, it was his turn, even though I thought that Tom Hardy was better in the movie. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> matter. But he, he did a great job. And if people start to moan about, well, but he's a straight man, so fucking what? Yeah, I agree with that. Now, and the movie, like you said, that movie is probably not even going to get made now unless they decide to just say, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to go ahead and go do it anyway. Who cares what people think? Uh, I don't see that happening, but maybe. I don't know. Uh, all right, so uh, let's – there's only a little bit left here but because we've been going for a little while. As he looked forward to starting a family, Tanzer became obsessed with the idea that he might one day lose his kids. Why that might happen, he didn't say, but he added that it remained his greatest fear. He was deeply moved by stories of men whose children had been taken away, men who insisted they'd been screwed by a system which callously neglected the rights and well-being of fathers. So, so this was the first part in the, in the article where I got really, really mad, actually, because it's really not a portrayal of how I expressed myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out what I wrote. When he writes that I became obsessed with the idea that I might one day lose uh, my kids and why that might happen, he didn't say. He portrays me as if I had no reason to have this fear besides that I was deeply moved by stories of men whose children had been taken away. I, I was not moved by stories, I was moved by the experiences of friends. Here is what I said. My first thought when I started dating women again was, I don't want to lose my children. I could not deal with losing my children. And that was partly, or to a big part, because I was in the military for three years and all my comrades from the military that were married and had children, they all lost their children. All of them except of one. And that was terrifying to me. So I was always aware that men don't get the same rights, especially in custody laws. So that was exactly what I said to him. This experience and the fact that 50% of marriages end in divorce justify my fear of potentially losing my children one day. It is not an obsession. It is an awareness of a real danger. So that was my statement. Huh. Yeah, and I mean, that means you gave a reason, even though he claims that you didn't, and you even had a story. And it's a good one, too. 
that would have been the thing good is, to put it was, in. It was out of my life. It was out of my life. I had like one, two, I roughly six or seven of my comrades. They lost their children, and now they're alienated from their children. Their sons don't even want to talk to them because the mothers keep telling lies about the fathers. Not in all cases. That is one case where the sons don't want to talk to him anymore. And he's a really great guy. And and when I met him and his children, his children were really small. One of the children is actually named after me, Philip. Um, and they were super close. And now they don't talk anymore. Mm. Uh, I got another super chat from Joey Jojo. He gives us $2 and says, robots will never divorce you or abuse you. Well, let's hope. Let's hope that that doesn't become the norm because we kind of need the human Not race. Not in favor of robots. No, no, I, I, want, I, want, I want a wonderful society where men and women are partners. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think robots are going to um, replace people, honestly. But, I mean, if it works for you, if that floats, floats your boat, go for it. Uh, all right, so the next bit from the article. Admittedly <laughs> – don't, don't get – Admittedly, there's a lot to unpack here, not least the regressive notion of women as walking wombs, oh my god, and Tanzer's believing he needed to find a female partner to raise children in a loving relationship. But to my mind, this is a good example of how the MRA ideology recruits by preying on men's fears, can you say projection? It was a tactic I recognized from my own time studying the movement. Well, what's your uh, response yeah. to that? So what I said, my response was insinuating that I view a woman as a walking womb just because I would like to have children with a woman I love is despicable and is uh, in complete contradiction to what I said about a loving relationship. At this point, I cannot give the author the benefit of the doubt, and I feel personally attacked. He also misquoted me to insinuate I don't believe in uh, same-sex couples can have a loving relationship. Again, this is nonsense. I imagine myself having a family with the woman I love. That is a personal choice, and I do not force it on others. When did the wish to have a family you love become controversial? My concerns about custodial laws are not what recruited me into the MRA ideology and calling the MRM an ideology, and that is a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic and political theory and politic, uh, policy, is not really accurate because it focuses on a, by a very wide range of issues that are in parts social, political, cultural, medical, religious, and personal without construction, uh, con constructing a system around the issues. The author portrays the MRM as an organization controlled and defined with a plan to recruit people. That is, in some ways, unfortunately, not the case. The MRM is a diverse group of very loosely connected people that want to raise awareness and potentially change issues that men and boys and by extension, women and girls in our society face. If men and women recognize that the issues are real and valid and they decide to be part of the MRM, then it is unfair to portray them as naive people tricked into supporting an unjust cause. I would argue that you find the fear recruiting strategy to a much larger extent in other movements. Sorry, that was quite lengthy, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's that that's fair. To, that's a good response. Uh, I couldn't have uh, I, I I couldn't have put it better myself. Is exactly what I would I would say the same the same idea. And the the walking wound thing is is just that those are just like little things. And I mean, I know that you know you spoke to Jack Ben. He's very charismatic, but I've seen tons and tons and tons of hit pieces on the MRM on uh, you know groups related to them on MGTOW on incels on Gamergate on all kinds of things and there's always yeah. these little they sprinkle these little, in these little yeah. things that are supposed to um, you know affect the audience emotionally they're supposed to say oh and, and it, he sees women as walking stupid. wombs you know exactly exactly yeah. it's these little words that stick with you I was actually 
thinking about making a t-shirt with a, with a womb with legs and giving that to my girlfriend. Uh, I think that would be <laughs> That's good. Yeah. For all their <laughs> bluster about feminism as a cult of victimhood, the truth is that MRAs can be pretty shameless in encouraging and exploiting men's own feelings of victimization. Woo, the projection. Not only in theaters. Listen to MRAs discuss, say, sexual assault allegations, which they usually claim are fabricated by feminists to hound men from their jobs, and you realize what they're really trying to do is engender a sense of powerlessness and a feeling that this could happen to you. It, it's intended to appeal to the audience's fear and self-interest, and it can be very effective. Holy cow. And he is I describing... Uh, political feminists to a T right now, especially journalist types. But okay, what what did you have to say to that? Uh, I wrote, I remember four speakers as the man, at the Men's Issues Conference pointing out that we should not fall into the trap of collective victimhood and that it is uh, our job not to complain but to change things. But problems have to be addressed and talked about. This is not victimhood, it is raising awareness. And let's talk about sexual allegations. I think it's fair to say that MRAs don't say sexual assault allegations are fabricated to haunt, haunt men from their jobs. But we do say that some sexual assault allegations are false allegations and that everybody needs to have due process. Not an outlandish opinion, I think. No, no. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the, the, the article where he says, um, where does it say? Oh, yeah. Sexual assault allegations, which they usually claim are fabricated by feminists to hound men from their jobs. All right. So first of all, um, feminists are not necessarily the people that we're concerned with when it comes to sexual assault allegations uh, and all and the thing is the timing on this is really interesting because in the me too in the wake of the me too movement still going on right now people are losing their jobs for stuff that was said for stuff that you cannot be confirmed whether it's happened or not decades in the past and they're losing their jobs and their and their reputations are smeared and slandered and you know it's this the main thing that we have a concern for is due process and the and the only way you can can, can actually um, move forward in discussing things from a from a perspective of due process and innocent until proven guilty is to be able to accept the idea that people men and women can make false allegations and Absolutely. and they do sometimes and so that's not the same as saying the reason why men are losing their jobs is because feminists are making things up that's a that's a, a misrepresentation of the argument clearly Absolutely. a straw man and it's not very productive it's just a way of saying why are you complaining about this thing you should just not rape women <laughs> And it's like, we're trying, like, look, you don't have to do anything. Like, you're basically making it, I don't know if you know, to, know this, but uh, statistically, men are hiring, or businesses run and operated by men are hiring fewer women now because they're afraid of the uh, potential of a sexual assault allegation. Because oh, the I danger, be the, yeah, because the danger of a woman using um you know sexual assault as a tool to ruin people to make her job easier to rise in the ranks whatever these things are happening and women are actually um less comfortable working in environments where there are men these days because they're afraid that those men are going to sexually assault them or harass them this is a, there is a culture of fear that's growing in the professional sphere i i, th I think i think like so many other well-intentioned let, let's let's assume it's well-intentioned well-intentioned movement i think the me too instead of saying in, instead of like crucifying every person who did and did not uh years ago do something 
I think they should focus on telling women and men, if there is something you don't feel comfortable with, stand up and say no, even if it costs your job. Like, for example, the whole casting couch thing is really also comes down to, and, and I, it's shit, it's shit that mm -hmm. some people have to, uh, in the past, had to, let's say, flirt with certain people to get into places, but it will never be completely avoided. That doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it okay at all. But... I think there was an extent, to, to some extent, those were deals. Yeah. They were like, well, how much are you willing to give for your career? And people do that all the time. And you have to teach young girls and young men, don't do it. That's how you get rid of the perpetrators. If they don't have victims anymore, if, if people actually stand up right there in this moment and stand up and say, okay, this is what happened. That's how you get rid of the culture, not um, complaining afterwards. I mean, I think, yeah. I think you can complain afterwards, but what you should say is, it's not, oh, everybody else was bad and I'm the victim. You, you also have to own and say, I was stupid. For example, I found myself in situations in the porn industry where I was raped. I didn't say no. It wasn't the fault of the other actor and it wasn't really the fault of the studio. They could have asked if everything was okay, they didn't, but it wasn't their fault. It was my fault because I thought I have to be professional, um, I have to make this job and I didn't need the money, I have to say. I didn't need the money, but I, I felt like if I say no, I come across as problematic and whiny and so on. And I let the other person rape me and it was very painful and I felt horrible afterwards. Would I attack the studio afterwards? No, but I will tell people, if you find yourself in a situation like this, getting raped is not professional. Mm -hmm. Saying, saying, sorry, I can't work with this with this actor. I'm so sorry about this. You might not get jobs in the future, but so be it. Um, yeah, you you have to stand up for yourself, and you have to live with the consequences. And sometimes saying no is bad for your career. But hey ho, that it's your life. You have sometimes you have to make decisions. What's more important, my happiness, my life, or my career? And that's life for everybody. Right. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, uh, again, well said. You haven't been here very long, but you're picking up on a lot of the, uh, you know, the good points. That's good. So, once we debated the merits of family law, I asked Tanzer about photo um, I'm sorry. I asked Tanzer about pornography and whether his career had informed his view that men were mistreated by society. With the porn world still reeling from high-profile rape allegations, did he recognize a portrayal of the industry as a hotbed of exploitation in which powerful men routinely abuse their positions? Uh, I was lucky to have a positive experience in porn, he told me. The team I worked with was like a family, with everyone being supportive of each other. There were, of course, some problems, actors with drug issues, for example, but the production company really tried to help people with that. In fact, if anything, it seemed much better than the straight world. Although I hadn't made straight porn, we shared a set a couple of times and I saw men being treated like shit by women performers. They were being screamed at and told exactly what they could and couldn't do. And I guess this one upset you too. We're, we're getting close to the hour and a half mark. So maybe after we respond, you respond to this, we'll just do like one more that's maybe your favorite and, and we'll call it there. Is that okay? That is absolutely uh, okay, but you're actually at my favorite. Because oh, well, this that, is... <laughs> this, <laughs> okay, I'm glad this, I read it. This part, was also, this part was used as the headline for, their, for the article on Facebook. And it got... So far, it has uh, 600 responses of calling me 
like a misogynistic pig and that I ignore the suffering of women in the porn industry um, because he, because they quoted um, uh, I saw men being treated like shit by women performers. They were being screamed at and told exactly what they could and couldn't do. And obviously that makes it look as if uh, I object to consent <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in the in the straight porn industry and here's what I uh, what I wrote to this this is a horrible misrepresentation of what I said and he intentionally left out what my position was about the experiences of women in the porn in porn and prostitution my real quote was I have to say that in the straight porn business I felt sorry for the men and the women I felt sorry for the women being objectified by the genre and I felt very sorry for the men being treated like shit by the women but again this is purely anecdotal because I, I constantly uh, made, made sure that he knows that I have not a lot of experience with straight porn that's why I said again this is purely anecdotal because you yeah you just shared that, sets with them so yeah after that I was explaining at great length that people, in this case I was talking about women specifically, uh, that don't have the choice for financial or other reasons whether or not they wanted to do a job like prostitution or porn are always victims. I also didn't say, in fact, if anything, it seemed much better than the straight world. But even though I didn't say it, I would agree that this statement uh, based on my limited knowledge of the straight porn business, is true. Um, the fact that Mr. Jackman intentionally left out all of my concern and empathy towards the situation of the porn prostitution industry is shameless and unforgivable. I have more personal experience and therefore real compassion when it comes to rape than most virtue signaling so-called social justice warriors and hashtag me too supporters and Mr. Jack, yeah, supporters. And yeah. Mr. Jackman knew that because I told him about experiences of letting an actor rape me on set because I felt like I had to be professional and I felt like I couldn't say no. I didn't say no, so my coworker is not to blame. But I was in agony and felt humil humiliated and trapped. I know what rape, at least one version of it, feels like, and I have deep compassion for all real victims, female, male, and trans. So that was my statement to that, and that really upset me because I, I really try to see both sides and include everybody. And the fact that he portrayed me in such a negative way, it's it's shameless, and. Mm. I and so many people that wrote the article or the headline on Facebook, they were personally hurt by what I supposedly said. And all their comments were like, don't you know what it feels like for a woman, Papa? And they're right to say that because that's how I was portrayed. So right. I would say they're responding the in the way. Yeah, it's the responding in the way that the vice uh, writer Jackman decided to represent your arguments. So naturally, it was like. This is, of course, what people are going to say to you if they think that that's what you believe, right? And just in order to to harm the men's rights movement, he, he used me and, and, yeah, he used me uh, to create a bigger divide between men and women, I would say, because to these readers, I was a typical misogynist man who doesn't care about women. And... Yeah. Obviously, that, that isn't true. And I, I don't even care about the men's rights movement issue. Like, just as a man, I'm being misrepresented. And the men's rights movement is completely misrepresented. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, it's all about, like, how, how can I... Because if they... Okay, if they destroy your character, if they destroy you who you are what your beliefs are you know uh if they can slander you then the only thing they have to do after that is connect you to the mrm and then exactly. it destroys them by it's like guilt by association except in reverse normally they would say well he's an mra and that should make like all of your opinions invalid but they just did the reverse they basically said oh look look these are the terrible things he believes and by the way he's a he's a part of the mrm 
and at the end of the article, which is really interesting, and to be honest, I actually think that to a certain degree he liked me, Robert Jackman, um, because, well, I got this feeling in the interview, but maybe he's just a very good liar. Um, but at the end of the article, he actually turns it around and says again that it's almost not my fault that I'm being tricked into the MRM movement and that they target losers and yeah. nerds and outsiders and that I am a weak person who was preyed upon by the man's rights movement and that I'm being used. So at the end, he's like, well, he might be a misogynistic, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, even he was used by the man's rights movement. Um, therefore, he's a little bit of a victim as well. It, it's like, really? Really? Yeah. So so I, now, first I'm an asshole, and now I'm, I'm a victim asshole um, who's just not smart enough to stay away from the, from the bad movement. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the, the rest of the article for the people who are watching. Uh, so they know what's in it. I put a link to it below as well. So, yes. okay. Perhaps what's most disturbing about Tanzer's journey isn't his professional background. It's that someone in his position, aware of the masculinity issues that some men face and struggling to reconcile his own desire for a family with his nonconformist identity, would feel the urge to support the same gender norms which, at least from my perspective, had not served him well. You can go ahead and respond to that. I don't even know <laughs> what this... Honestly, I read that and I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? So my response was, I'm not exactly sure what the author means when he writes that I support the same gender norms which hadn't served uh, me well. And thus, I'm not sure what is most surprising for him about me being an MRA. Maybe it's the myth that only a white, straight, cis man can be an MRA. That obviously is just a myth. Everybody who has compassion can, and I would argue should be an MRA, or at least supportive of raising awareness of man's issues. Yeah, uh, I mean, what, what it seems like is he's working from some assumptions that he's made about the MRM. And assumptions Absolutely. and things that he's sort of like been learned, you know, uh, taught about masculinity in general. So the fact that you wanted to have a biological child with a woman and stay with that woman is you. Outrageous. Yeah, it's outrageous. And you're compromising who you really are. You're, 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 you know, you're conforming yourself to the gender roles. To, it's like, it's like a gay man in the closet starting a family in the 1950s. It's the same thing, you know, and yeah. that's what he, and he's saying that that's what you're doing. And he's saying that the MRM is at least in part responsible for that. And, and it's, it's got, and probably because, and I think this is just like what people at Vice generally believe they think that men and women are interchangeable. So if you had just adopted or if you um, had a, you know, a, a woman like carry your child to term, but you would raise them with another man, then it would have been the same, same results. You know, you could just tra change out a, a, a mother for another father or whatever, and you would get the same result. And that whether or not that's true is irrelevant because this is your exactly. choice, right? Yeah, it it's if, if that's if that's what other people want to do, then that's absolutely fine as long as, as it's um, positive for the children and everybody involved. That's absolutely fine. I just didn't feel that way for me. Right. It's just it's your choice. So it, yeah. that's the that's the issue is that, you know, my, um, my body, my choice. Yeah, almost. Well, hey, I don't know if men can do that, but but yeah, but that's like the, I, I joke. But that's the um, I think that's where he's coming from. That's where he's getting. And of course, he doesn't see the MRM as as um, progressive at all. It's all just like guys that want to go back to the old days where we have criticized um, traditionalism. A lot, like we. I mean, we know that it's it's stuck, it's not I mean, in, in suitable. Days, you know, we were, stuck, we were stuck in really rigid gender roles as well that that mm -hmm. cost us our, our lives. And some of these gender roles are still around. 
but there should be uh, productive and loving ways to to change these gender roles without attacking masculinity because masculinity is not the problem it's it's um uh it's unhealthy masculinity unhealthy femininity it's uh, unhealthy society structures that force people into certain behaviors um they need to be changed uh and and some of that might be going back a little bit but that's not regressive i mean when you look at um child um like bringing up children back in the days uh, it was very authoritarian then in the 70s they changed to less affair both was shit authoritarian the children really suffered under it and then under less affair where you don't give the children any rules um they they can't actually they, they get really anxious under it and now we're bouncing back into something very healthy where you have um rules but lo love in in a very good mixture and i think that's what we need we need just some idea well i think that family structures for one thing are a really good thing my girlfriend she told me um about a study for example where people are the happiest where parents are the happiest and they said that parents in portugal are really happy um because the grandparents take a lot of responsible uh, responsibility for the children as well so there is not as much pressure on the shoulders of the parents mm -hmm. so actually you could simplify it as in bigger families or closer families um make you happier that is an old fashioned way of looking at the world but i don't think it sounds very outlandish um and what's wrong with going back to things that seem to work well and that does not mean um taking the vote away from women or uh or taking taking any rights away from women it just means that oh we tried this experiment it obviously didn't work very well we tried another experiment that that didn't work very well maybe a mixture of both is to, the way to go forward yeah or something new it's like if you're in a maze and you know you're headed towards a dead end maybe, maybe you should just backtrack and try another direction um yeah. okay so last bit we might as well just go last through the bit. whole thing it's a cruel irony of the feminist movement that... of the anti-feminist oh oh yeah, yeah yeah i'm sorry it's a cruel irony that um of the anti-feminist movement that the men lured into being patriarchy's foot soldiers are so often those badly served by it in the first place <laughs> i'm having trouble with this sentence it's actually really infuriating to read the nerds the outsiders the gosh and the lonely in some ways tanzer's story is unique in others it is sadly not <laughs> the tears the the, the feels <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This guy cares so, more for you than you do, obviously. Obviously, I'm I'm very thankful that at least one person fights for me, for me and my rights. So my response was even though a lot of MRAs self-define as anti-feminists, um a lot actually prefer the term non-feminist, the men's rights movement is the men's rights movement, not the anti-feminist movement. Otherwise, I wouldn't be part of it. I was not not lured. I am an I am not naive nor blind. I question the movement and I disagree with some uh voices of the movement and so do many others. My story is unique and yes, my story is sadly normal. A person who cares about people who suffer decides to do something about their suffering. The sad part is that we are so few. That was my end sta statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, you know, it's a good statement to put it on. I think it's kind of, um, well, I'm, I'm going to hold his feet to the fire for, for this, you know, this idea that, first of all, I think it's, it isn't accurate to call it an anti-feminist movement. I mean, I think that there are a lot of anti-feminists in the movement, but I think that there are people all over the place. We got, we haven't, we have MRAs that are trying to make, feminism work with it we have mras that are just non-feminist like they're not concerned we have mras that are doing 
they they would echo many of the sentiments that feminists have, but they just don't want to call themselves feminists. They just want to call themselves, you know, uh, humanists or egalitarians, and they're just checking this stuff out. We got people from all over, and that's one of the things that's great about it is that we are working these things out. We are constantly um, at the 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 point of tension between two sides of an argument, and that is where we stand because that's how we figure out what the best way forward is, whether that is generally or personally. And it's not about attracting, I mean, we do have a tendency to attract people that are, I guess, sort of not mainstream people, but maybe mm -hmm. that is just a sign that those are the kinds of people that have an interest in this kind of thing. Well, look, look at every movement, every single movement. Is it feminist, LGBTQ? Um, it's always, the minorities within the minority that that put most effort into it because they are the the most disenfranchised a lot mm -hmm. of men's rights activists like the own the men's rights activists that accidentally find to it for example is when they lose their children uh, but if if you are very normal part of society and not in any way uh, a minority within the minority, then you're usually not very interested in certain political issues. Um, in the, I would say that in the LGBTQ um, uh, movement, the, the most active ones are probably uh, trans people and uh, Lesbians are were very strong. I don't know how strong they are at the moment, um, but it's usually not the gay men are usually not as um, intensely into it because they they are already part of the mainstream now. Yeah. Um, so I, I think movements attract certain kinds of people, and these are sometimes nerds, and these are sometimes the disenfranchised. Um, I think in my case, I think in my case, a big reason why I support victims and why I want to help is because I was an, an X-Men fan when I was a kid and I still am yeah, X-Men forever. Um, and the X-Men obviously are a symbol of, of an, let's say, oppressed group. <laughs> I, I don't like that word, but people that were hated but they still want to help the other people. So I, I like I became, I would say in some ways, uh, I became an MRM uh, or a supporter of victims because I am a nerd in some ways. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the kind of thing, because again, you would have to be in that, in that sort of, uh, I would even call it a privileged position to have the curiosity mm -hmm. and, to like explore these ideas, you know? Uh, okay, Most so- Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Most people that are most people that are just living their lives and are very much in the middle, they actually don't have to think about certain issues right. because right. they don't face right. the issues. Right, they don't, and and that they're and they simultaneously those are the people we were trying to reach. So it, yeah, can, it can be, but, but you know what? That's the mainstream. Um, I, it is. Uh, uh, sorry, your your colleague, uh, what, the honey badger. She did the last. The last talk on the yes, conference. Allison, yeah, my boss. Alice, of course, yeah. yeah, exactly. Allison was talking about it. Where, how do you re how do you reach the mainstream? So first, it's it's the innovators or the people out that are really interested in certain things, and it's really difficult to reach the mainstream, uh, and that's what we're struggling with, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but you know what? We're working on it. Um, HBR uh, continues to grow, and I'm going to be – I get in people's face. I'm going to be doing it at MythCon this year, which is like a atheist conference in September, and oh. I'm going to try and get, okay. people, get in people's faces. God so. bless. What? God bless. Oh, <laughs> I'll be sure to say that to them. Um, <laughs> so I got a couple more super chats, and then we're going to wrap it up, Okay. Uh, yeah, all cool. right, Mr. Roboto gives us $2 and says, how does he feel about MGTOW? Actually, we talked about it in the first half hour. Um, so you just go back to that part of the video. Xerinx gives us $5 and says, because feminism doesn't build supports for the columns holding up the patriarchy. Nope, feminism totally doesn't do that. 
Uh, and Tyler Preston gives us $5 and says, Reading the article's comments on Facebook, I just want to scrub my eyes out with the steel wool coated with salt water. <laughs> yeah, but, but the comments are understandable. Well, first of all, uh, to stick to the uh, men's rights rhetoric, uh, first of all, they're still blue pilled. So they yeah. still live in this world where there's where the men's rights are just not a thing. And then they read obviously the this outrageous statement of me that women don't suffer in porn, which obviously I didn't say. Um, and I think it's very understandable that they have a very emotional reaction, maybe rightfully so. I think it's great that people react to things. I just wish that people would challenge um, their views a little bit more and would actually read the whole article and then dig deeper. But in this case, it's almost impossible for them to dig deeper. Now they can because I released the end, the statement about the interview, but they don't know anything about me. I could be a misogynistic asshole and they're just reacting to how I was portrayed. And I do understand their reaction, but people have to be a bit slower to their outrage, I think. Yeah, well, this is what th this is uh, something that you're probably going to get a lot more of. It only it only builds up from there, especially when you're dealing with the mainstream media. So, uh, all right. So I think that this was a very productive conversation. I want to thank you so much for coming on on such short notice. So no I'm, problem. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun too, and it was good talking to you again. I I see you're doing well. You color your hair or something because <laughs> it looks different. Yeah. Uh, I, I I wanted to say in the beginning, oh, just for being on the show, I actually colored it uh, in the color of the the hair of a honey badger. Oh, so, okay. But okay. Actually, <laughs> it's more it's more an it's more an experiment gone wrong. No, I, I did a hair dye job on uh, on a lady, and I still had a lot of bleach left over. And I so I, when I do that, I usually just smear it into my hair, and then ah. usually I regret it. But hey ho, <laughs> my girlfriend. <laughs> Loves it. No, she hates well, it. if yeah. you if you really want to do honey badger hair, and I'll get you on next time if you do it, it's got to be red with a white stripe down the middle. That's that's basically what it should be. It's like red because that's our our honey badger is red and white. It's red all over okay, with a with a white happy. stripe down the middle. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, but honestly, if you ever want want me back on the radio show, I'd love to do more. Uh, I, I'd love to be become more active in the movement. And to, for me, a problem is that I don't have a platform. Oh, okay. Well, hell yeah. I mean, if you if you start one, people were asking if you have a YouTube channel and stuff. If you start one, I will plug it. And uh, you can go and, and rant about everything that you feel. Um, and I will I don't let rant. people know and share. Well, you know what I mean? Like talk. Yeah. I don't say well, rant I actually, in a negative yeah, sense. I, I would I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about calling me the nice MRA, uh, <laughs> just like um, Christina Hoff Sommers calls herself the feminist. The, the factual feminist, uh, as a like almost like a contradiction in itself. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm already. I, I, nice I think <laughs> I think I currently hold that title as nice MRA. Um, Oh, I absolutely. To, yeah, absolutely. I have been able to get on uh, feminists and they don't hate me. Uh, Brittany Simon still talks to me. So uh, that that's a good thing. But uh, uh, well, yeah, well, I, well, maybe we can work something out. So anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you, Philip, for coming on the show. Thank you guys for watching. All of his contact info is right there on the screen. So go ahead and follow him on Twitter um, at your own peril. And we will uh, <laughs> we'll talk to you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody.